started uh, in December of 84. I began working at KYT November 8, 1981. Uh, I started here in October of, oh my God. My date of hire was 9999, so I uh, can't forget that. When did I start? July 2005. A little over 12 years now and all. 22? I'm a shooter, not a mathematician, so. I've enjoyed news for, for 30 years because I get to be outside and get to see people. And uh, if I had to stay inside, uh, I don't think I would have stayed in news very long. I, I love doing this. It's, it's fun. It, you're, you're outdoors and you're challenged. You know, we do get a paycheck. That's pretty cool. <laughs> this right here, this is my office. This is where I work. This is where I play. This is, this is what I do what I do. Because it's the greatest job in the world. I mean, I really believe that sometimes. Sometimes I'm like, oh, why did I get into this? But it's, there's very few jobs that you can go and see everything and be part of everything and not just do that one thing every day. Primarily, uh, being a videographer is to get the video. Sometimes you're running, sometimes you're jumping, sometimes you're crawling, but you're not sitting very often. Rain, snow, sleet, or shine, we're out there every day. Uh, capturing the images and the sounds. As a photographer, my job is to go out and tell the stories of people of everyday life. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. And many times you're on your own and you have to dig up your own ideas and find your own info and things like that. It would surprise people how much uh, the stories on the news day in and day out you'll see where there's not an actual reporter with us in the field. You know, we'll show up to a story and people come up to you and kind of act confused and wondering where the reporter is. And you got to get them to uh, get them to open up to you. Um, and if they can open up to you and build that relationship to a stranger, I, I think that makes it all worthwhile. This Frankfurt field is transforming into a baseball field, a unique one, one where you can't keep your eye on the ball. The thing that makes life interesting is the possibility of dreams coming true. The presentation and the groundbreaking for the world's first baseball park for the visually impaired. Can I get a please a big round of applause? <laughs> this represents giving that opportunity back to those without, without their eyesight. It's called beep ball, a game where you hit what you hear, and the base looks like a football tackling dummy. You'll know where it is because it makes noise. Just follow the sound. Uh, I'm gonna take you over here where they where they going at. And you can try. It. They're gonna put a blindfold on you. Not I don't need you, a blindfold. Not that you need it. But. <laughs> not everyone out here is totally blind. As you release, you say pitch. Because when they hear pitch, they're swinging. Okay. Using your ear as your eye is easier said than done. But this is the life of the visually impaired. It'd be feeling good to be able to play with, play with my son again and show him how to play. It'd be real nice. The outfielders, well, they have to listen for the ball and corral it before the runner gets to base. That's an out. Okay, I think I'm ready. Michael Lewis is the pro out here. He plays on a team in Louisville. When I'm hitting, I don't listen to the ball because it's all timing with my pitcher. I have to swing consistently, I have to swing on time, and I have to trust in him to do the rest. Now this Frankfurt field will be transformed into a game everyone can see, just in a different way. I walk in and they're like, hey, guess where you're going today? And I'm like, oh, okay, where? And it's like, you're shooting for Sam. You got to be downtown. Uh, you're going down in the, uh, the, you know, the hole. From balconies, sidewalks, and nearby buildings, people stare and marvel at the giant hole in the middle of downtown. We receive special permission to go to the bottom. First, a safety vest, hard hat, and safety glasses. No driving down into the hole. We had to walk down a steep ramp of rock with project manager Tim Lindy. This looks about as solid as it could be in terms of the walls versus dirt. I mean, if you were going to be bunkered down inside some place, I mean, this looks like this is this pretty This would stout. be it. Yeah. Just going by what the geologist said the other day, this is the strongest rock around here. And it should be. A UK rock expert tells me he estimates this massive wall of limestone is 450 million years old. We are 31 feet below the streets of downtown Lexington. This is at the bottom of Center Point right now. And this wall of limestone is what much of Lexington is built on. 
But before they drilled into all this limestone and blew it up, a huge barrier was constructed to keep the dirt above the rock from caving in. So to give you an idea of just how deep this is, street level is just below the top of that shoring barrier. To make this three-story underground parking lot, trucks have hauled out 60,000 cubic yards of rock. But what looks like just rock to most of us is a history of earth. Near the top of the limestone is a narrow band of brown-looking rock called bentonite. It's a layer of volcanic ash two to three inches thick. And that limestone? A trained eye can actually spot the fossils of tiny organisms that lived when this part of the world was closer to where Brazil is today, in a subtropical climate. We did notice water coming down the walls of the limestone and a couple of pools forming at the bottom. That's underground water that we've started getting in here. We think it's the water table, which when we, we ran into it over here on this side of the job site last Friday, and we started pumping it out. In the next couple of weeks, the footers will go in and then concrete poured for the parking garage. Many in Lexington will be able to say they witness center point built, literally from below the ground up. The spontaneity of it. It's something new every day. The people we meet and the stories we get to tell, uh, it's, it's something different every day. The spontaneity of it. Um, many times you go out and you're not sure if you're even going to get anything and, and sure enough you turn up something and you get a good story. It's something new every day. I don't know when I walk through the door I don't know whether I'm going to Pulaski County, Corbin or staying in town or I don't know what I'm doing until I walk in. The, walk in. The people we meet and the stories we get to tell uh, it's, it's something different every day. God only knows what you'll be doing. Uh, you, you just go with the flow, you go with the punches. Uh, you, you're constantly learning different things. Every day is a new adventure. I meet people from all walks of life, from, uh, from people living in, on the street uh, to presidents of the United States um, and everything in between. Yeah, you don't really ever know where, <laughs> you don't know for sure when it's going to end. And, uh, <laughs> And uh, or where you're going to end up, and uh, which which is kind of the fun part. You know, my favorite days are when you realize you get the opportunity to tell a story and do it in a unique way. Woo! I'm getting this. Come and get it. I'm glad that it's warm out. While it's hot. All the snow's melting. Well, not hot, but 48, a number people are raving about. That's why we're here. And taking advantage of. You want to swing in the clouds? We asked her where she wanted to go, and she said to the park. I'm going to feed the ducks over here. And for today only. When it's good weather, we try to come out. While it's well above freezing. It eats it. Any little excuse to get outside. Jump. Good job. You can have good weather one day and bad weather the next day. Bad as in Arctic cold, like below zero cold. And it's coming right back tomorrow as if it never left. Well, we had a long day in yesterday and uh, a long day of shoveling our driveway. Not the snow days kids jump for joy about. Go get some hot chocolate. Yes. They won't let us go out if it's snowy, rainy, or under, uh, like, under 40 degrees. How about 40 below that? Yeah, so they might not let us out once again, which really sucks. <sighs> it's cabin fever at its finest. Yep. Going it. I was running. He's been it. getting on my nerves. This tastes like cereal. Everyone knows how little brothers are. Figured today the kids could use a, a day out and since it was so nice. It's their last chance. Definitely a good good break to come out. To have a snow day. <laughs> this is awesome. Outside in Lexington, Jerrica Insco, WKYT. Oftentimes you gotta deal with noise in the background. But we don't call that noise, we call that natural sound. The cool thing is, and it's not just about this, it's about life. You can learn something different every day, and that's, that's pretty special. From this view, it looks like a peaceful country home, but we can confirm it's anything but quiet. 
Can you see my hands? Even challenging to get an interview. Mom, go over there and check on the camera. Danny and Jeanette Slavin wanted children since they married in 2004. After three years of trying, they decided to do in vitro fertilization. A process where eggs are taken from Jeanette and mixed with Danny's sperm in a fertility lab. Watch for the break and you would place a sperm and then draw out. Then some of the embryos are inserted back in Jeanette to hopefully attach and grow. The Slavin's journey started with this man. 15% of couples have infertility. A fertility specialist in Lexington. Dr. James Aiken says with the lab advancements in in vitro fertilization, couples have a one in three chance of getting pregnant with a single embryo. I'll turn it off. With the Slavins, they took a shot and placed three embryos in Jeanette, and now three perfect girls. We were shocked. The shock has settled after six years. The infertility troubles of their past are now covered with juggling schedules in school. They say there's no more room for more. We didn't want any more kids. We already had three. Got my hands full. Got my arms full. <laughs> you see me in the video. But they still had extra embryos. Four extra. The embryos were frozen in Dr. Aiken's lab. Options for those frozen embryos are destroy them or donate them. A growing trend, much because women are choosing careers before children. Women have become more career oriented. They have delayed childbearing, and uh, infertility increases as you get older. Crazy soft day! The Slavens decided to anonymously donate their four extra embryos. Look, guys, I'm in the grass! I feel like if they carry the babies to term, then that would be their baby, not our baby. And give a chance at parenthood, a chance at one time this family so desperately wanted. For us, it wasn't really giving the baby up for adoption. It was just giving someone else a chance of pregnancy. It's pay it forward and do something nice for someone else, and someone that might not have the chance to have a child. And it's just a very good thing to do. A personal choice, but one gaining in popularity. But, you know, it's the, uh, when it all comes together and the pressure's on and you pull it off, there ain't no better feeling in the world. Most people think that there's, you know, 30 of us from each station running around shooting stories every day when, when most days it's, anywhere from two to five. I think the misconception is is that we basically just turn on the camera and shoot. There's actually a lot of thinking, a lot of preparation, a lot of training that you learn through over the years to be able to tell a story from start to finish with a beginning, middle and end. And There's a lot more involved than then just turning on the camera and taking a snapshot. I think the one thing that people, that our viewers don't know is the extreme amount of dedication that our group of photographers and uh, multimedia journalists do throughout the day to put forth the best product they can. I walk in at 9.30 in the morning and they tell me I gotta have something done by 12. And it's literally at 12, not 12.02, not 12 and 30 seconds. It takes a special brand of crazy to be able to work efficiently under the types of deadlines that this job creates. It's supposed to be where it's supposed to be and you don't miss it. Uh, so that pressure is on. The amount of training and the amount of dedicated hours we put into not only doing our jobs but to become better at it is something that I hope people will notice because we do try to go above and beyond in our craft of photojournalism. When it all comes together and the pressure's on and you pull it off, there ain't no better feeling in the world. I take the Snyder freeway to uh, 65, meet up with 64, and then on in through the streets here in the neighborhood. A year can change a couple in profound ways. He has been in four different hospitals with six admissions to those hospitals. He's had um, two surgeries.
different procedures. Dickie Gregory's been through a physical nightmare. His wife, Mary Alice, an emotional one. I never thought that I, I would cry every day of my life. I've, I've just never been like that. I've never been a crier. But this has just been so, so hard to deal with. She watched her husband fall backward down half a dozen rows at Rupp last year. The fall paralyzed Mr. Gregory from the neck down. Our trying to accept what has happened and live with it has been hard because of the closeness of our lives. Our, our, you know, we were such a close couple and, and did everything together. Mrs. Gregory's hope is that she'll be able to move her husband from this nursing center to a handicap accessible home. And in order to do that, she'll have to move too. Our home is for sale right now. It has been for a while. The, the hurt is just, it's well, very devastating. Like they say, it is what it is. Mr. Gregory makes the most of every day he has. Oh, there's one. He battles spasms and fights to speak. When he can't go on, he thinks about the Big Blue Nation. Coach Cal has visited Gregory twice. A lot of times, you just feel like giving up. But then you get to think about all these prayers and people, cards and stuff. And you feel like, well, I can't give up because they're all counting on me. This man hasn't forgotten his fans. In Louisville, Kristen Kennedy, WKYT. The biggest misconception is probably that we're just really mean-spirited people to the point that we get enjoyment on someone else's pain, and that's really not the case at all. We really don't get in a lot of people's faces like, uh, like we're maybe portrayed in some movies. When we get the chance to do a story about some kind of positive thing coming out of a bad situation, uh, you really enjoy doing those types of stories. Hey, how are y'all doing? Can we get you October Fest and a white Sure. Can you have your IDs, please? By mid-afternoon, people were already piling in. Here's a list of what we've got on tap. Filling every seat. And for you. Standing at every table. You got it. All of this. There you are. <laughs> Thank you very much. In the middle of the week. It'll be 1075 altogether. This is a really great, you know, Friday night, Saturday night kind of crowd. And for this to happen on a Wednesday at this hour, this shows a lot about what the community, what the neighborhood's all about. All of this to raise money for Guam National Guard soldier Noel Espino. Just having a freak accident happen to someone who doesn't deserve it, um, it's you know, really kind of scary. Espino is still at UK recovering from critical injuries suffered after being hit by an SUV while standing outside the bar. To help Espino and his family with medical bills, the beer trap will be donating one dollar from every pint poured at the bar on Wednesday. The reason they're all here is pretty terrible, but the uh, the way that the community rallies around that and the way everybody comes together and shows support, that feels pretty great. Lexington is such a a giving town in general. You know, it, I I totally expected a, a big crowd. A small way to give back, the bar owners say, to a man who deserves every dollar poured. That, for me, is more than a paycheck. That's more than anything this business can give me because we've made the people happy. This is my 20 fourth year I think at the station. Um, the first five years I was in news, uh, but, but since then I've, I've done nothing but sports. It's a lot of fun. We get to go to a lot of places, see a lot of different things, and uh, it's, it's challenging because there are thousands of stories out there that are told and even more that aren't told. So we get to, we get to go get our fingers dirty and hands dirty and go try to find those. I, I think I would surprise a lot of people when I told them how little uh, of the actual sporting events I get to watch, especially if you're just saying from, from start to finish. I like meeting the people. I like meeting the players, uh, the athletes. They all have unique stories. Uh, they all came from somewhere, and that's, that's part of the fun of the job is to try to 
to bring that out so that the public and, and some of the other fans in the area can, can hear what, what these athletes, uh, what they do away from the court, away from the field. When you get to know these kids and you get to know the coaches, golly, you root for them. You can't on television openly root, but privately, we're all human. I want that kid to win because she has worked her tail off for the last five years. She overcame a car accident. He overcame uh, cancer. As a graduate of the University of Kentucky, it's, you know, it's difficult sometimes to not allow your emotions to spill over into the work, but you know, that's just part of the job and uh, you, know, you have to do the best you can to, to not be a fan. That's kind of the protocol uh, of the media. You know, we don't cheer. Uh, we, we try to remain uh, unbiased and, and do the best that we can. Sports is fun. Uh, you know, the majority of the time we're talking about things that are fun. We're talking about balls bouncing and, and uh, you know, people are excited to see us when we show up to, you know, we're not showing up to a car wreck or to a, you know, a tough situation. Most of the time we're showing up to a place where people are welcoming, welcoming us in and they're happy we're there because we're usually covering their, their team or their sport or their kid and, and, and it's more of a, it's more of an enjoyable atmosphere. In news, it could literally be life or death, and, and that's the tragic part of what we do. Uh, with sports, it's always about uh, um, having fun. But the people that I did a 33-minute video of the entire season still say it brings tears to my eyes because I'll never be that young again, but we captured a moment in time that we can relive daily and we thank you and your co-workers for doing that and that for me is more than a paycheck that's more than anything this business can give me because we've made the people happy to hear their stories you know they might be a great athlete on the field or on the court but they have uh, you know a very interesting life away from sports um, it, it's fun to be able to to bring those stories to our viewers and to our readers on the website and uh, it's, it's just part of what, you know, what I do. That's the part of it that, that is a lot of fun and is very interesting and, and it kind of keeps you going. I mean, even if it's covering the athletes at Kentucky, you get to know those guys and girls and, and you know, on a more personal level than maybe the average fan does, and that's fun. But then when you actually get to tell a story um, with an athlete or, or with a kid that's using sports to, to overcome an obstacle, uh, that's really the, the joy that you get out of it because you know you get to know somebody on a personal level and, and you get to tell their story and at this point what may not be something that's widely known becomes known to a large audience of people because you get to tell their story and, and everyone gets to see it. There's a special sound we use. Life isn't a matter of miracles. T-I-O. Everybody quiet. But of moments. <laughs> there you go. When we first met Kelly Melton one year ago. No, not yet. What? I'm not, I'm Get that hand down there. Get no, 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 no. I'm a count. Right. Kelly, I'm a count. Good moments were hard to come by. There. Oh. Oh. A seven year old Kentucky fan beginning his fight with leukemia. Last year, there were two occasions we almost lost him. Hey, you're good to go. Okay. <laughs> this last year, just full of energy, bouncing around, active. You better do it again. How oh, enter? Enter. Enter. Yes. Good job. After missing job. most of his first grade okay. year, Clap once if you hear me. Kelly has returned to school, reunited with his first grade teacher, Mrs. Denny. Uh, that was tough, isn't it? She's an excellent teacher, okay. cares about the kids, and then she also makes them walk a fine line if she needs to. Let's put the pen up and have a little review here. We don't want him to be singled out. Um, it's very important to his family that he feel like one of the other kids. I believe you better try to talk. One thing that sets Kelly apart from the other kids is his admiration and connection to some of the biggest Kentucky Wildcats. He's taller than our van. Yeah, he really is taller than your van. I follow him on Twitter <laughs> to see the pictures of him and, and the basketball players and football players. Through Kelly's Twitter account and Facebook page, kicking it for Kelly. That's Dance Blue when I met him and Willie. He's gained experiences most UK fans could only dream of. Know him, know him, know him. I gave him the nickname Blondie. He even made a return trip to the Kentucky Derby. This is the same thing when we went to the Derby. Once again as a special guest of Nerland's Noel. You can tell that 
Nerlens cares a lot about him, and he even told us, he said he's like my little brother. Your hair's been growing. Mm -hmm. uh, except for now. But on the day after the derby, the reality of cancer returned. I don't want the camera to see this. Oh, see? Well, that looks good. Last year when Kelly was diagnosed with cancer. Yeah, but I have all of it. I have half of it gone already. Obviously, I was, I cared about what was happening. You still got a head full. And I explained as best I could to the kids what was going on because I, you know, I have had friends and relatives with cancer. But I couldn't really identify with it as well as I can now. If everybody will sit on the black line. Not One month after line. Kelly returned to school. But I pray for Miss Denny and stuff. Mrs. Denny was diagnosed with breast cancer. Oh, I cried. I mean, I, I, I felt really bad for, you know, she's a wonderful, caring person. And just hate to see something like that happen to somebody like her. I never played it. Going through the treatments like Kelly has, now that's made it a lot easier for me to empathize with him, I guess. And I think he has felt a connection too since coming back, knowing that I understand what he's been through. It looks easy, but it's not. No, there's nowhere else where that ship can be. And while the fight is far from over for Kelly in his quest to kick cancer, you're very welcome, sir. I wanted to play. Still in search of a miracle, Kelly is not alone. He's ready to move on and do whatever he wants to do. He definitely has the personality to do whatever he wants to do in the future. You know, I enjoy I enjoy the sports scene, and I like to tell everybody that I have a season ticket to, to just about everything, and I'm, I'm pretty fortunate. The biggest misconception about this business is that we show up at 6.15, read at 6.20, leave at 6.30, come back at 11 o'clock, and read that read whatever someone else has put together for us. Uh, I tell people all the time, we do not work hard in this business, we work long. A lot of times we spend the majority of our time not anchoring and reporting, but shooting games, uh, shooting press conferences, shooting interviews, doing stories and things like that. You know, I say that it's not like work to me. There's, there's some long hours involved, uh, particularly if, if Kentucky, let's say, is in the NCAA tournament and they're playing uh, you know, in a Final Four or something like that. There's a lot of work to be done, uh, a lot of long hours. Yeah, I'm at the arena, I'm at the event um, you know, watching the games, but, but there's also a lot of long hours. So it's not like I get to go to the games. Uh, it, it is still a job, and I, I, can't, uh, I can't root for my team and then you know, go back to the hotel and celebrate. There's a lot of work to be done after the game. That's the toughest part of the job is that there are no banker's hours. It's not 9 to 5, it's not 8 to 4, it's not 9 to 12 on the weekends. It is at least 8 hours, usually it's 10 to 11, and if you're really lucky, it's 12 or 13, and uh, especially with sports. Um, if UK plays at 9 o'clock at night, we have to sit here through the whole game, through the post game, put everything together, and uh, it, can be, it can be challenging. You know, a 10 to 12 hour work day, especially on a weekend, is normal. Um, but I think it's because of the love of the job, being able to tell a story, being able to cover a sporting event. I mean, there's obvious reasons why this job would be fun to a lot of people. When you get to know these kids and you get to know their parents and you get to know their brothers and sisters and their coaches and their, uh, their family, you somehow adopt them into your own family in many ways. You know, as much as I enjoy going to, say, a Kentucky basketball game, I also really enjoy finding a good story of, of just a kid going through an illness or, or finding a good story of um, you know, somebody overcoming an obstacle and using sports to do so. So I, it's, it's really the reward that I get from, from some of the stories and things like that. And that's why, that's, that's why I do the job. Left side offense, here we go. This no! is America's game. But you won't find any inflated egos. Cut up, fast. Fancy nicknames or max contracts among this pack of bulldogs. Get there, get there. We've all heard okay. stories of players here, being coached here. by their dad. You want to hit him right here and then slide over. But this team takes that to a whole nother level. Run right at him, Mason. Run right at him. Mason's dad, Marty, is the head coach of the Bulldogs. Go, Connor. An eight-year veteran of the NFL. That's it. That's Marty it. Moore holds the distinction as the first Mr. Irrelevant picked last in the 1994 draft to ever play in the Super Bowl. The career I had in football, you know, I, 
it's my duty, if you would, to the community and to these kids to, to give back what I've learned and pass that down. Line up behind the horns, Cone. Where are you, Eric? The Bulldogs quarterback's you, coach Eric? is anything hey, but irrelevant. Hey, get there, Cole. Get there. Get there. Back, outside backers. Cole's dad, Chad, knows a thing or two about tossing the pigskin. The 18th overall pick by the New York Jets in 2000. <laughs> Chad Pennington remains the NFL's all-time leader in career completion percentage. I enjoy it. My dad coached high school football for 30 years, and coaching is probably in my blood, I would say. Get outside, get outside, get outside, cut up. That's it. I just enjoy being around the kids, and I enjoy teaching them the true fundamentals of the game. However, Pennington isn't the only former pro quarterback on staff. We have some really good coaches out here, and uh, you know Marty does such an outstanding job running this league. I'm going to bring my football, and I'm going to get an autograph from you. No problem, man. Tim Couch, the former number one overall pick in the 1999 NFL Draft. Yeah, he played for the Browns, too. He played with me at the Browns. I know. Yeah. Is already grooming the next Couch quarterback. You know, it's a lot of fun for me to be out here with these kids and uh, just just try to teach them a little bit of what I know. And uh, you know, especially with my, my my own son Chase being out here and playing quarterback, you got the corner out here, okay? Look, all the way here. To these coaches, the sport of football is more than just teaching about the X's and the O's. It teaches commitment, dedication, toughness. You know, there's a lot of things that football teaches. You're going out here outside the dummy. It teaches our kids mental toughness, how to overcome obstacles and challenges. Uh, and such such a great game for teamwork. But at the end of the day, what you learn real fast is it's still about your players. It's still about who has the best players, regardless of how much knowledge that we have as coaches. If we don't block and tackle, we have no shot. There's a lot of planning goes into um, to working alone out in the field uh, because you don't have another person. You can't divide and conquer, so to speak. I am a one-man band reporter. I do the job pretty much of two people. When I get to a story, I get out immediately, start shooting video, looking for people to talk to, people to give me information. I'm kind of in control of my entire story. Well, being a one-man band reporter, if I can relate it to the, the metaphor of being in a band, again, you have uh, the drums, you have a guitar, you have bass, you have the singer. And I write, I shoot. I had it. A photographer does a whole lot more than a lot of people realize. They're a lot like a reporter in some cases. They just don't get in front of the camera. They'll go to a scene. They'll gather information. They'll interview people. They just never get in front of the camera. So what I do is, is similar to what a photographer does, except that I will actually write the script and then get in front of the camera and, and present the story. Well, the snow made things move just a little bit slower on the streets of Frankfurt this morning, but police say there were no major issues. They say there were about six fender benders. The early blast of winter made the morning commute a bit of a drag. I walk out and I got to clear my car off and cannot get it out of the driveway. But those low gray clouds had a silver lining. I saw the dome. I said, well, we got to get, get a picture of that. Say what you will about the traffic headaches. The city of Frankfurt looks pretty darn good in a coating of snow. And you never realize how photogenic your town is until, uh, until the snow falls. And Frankfurt's crown jewel, the Capitol building, is the icing on this frosty cake. It'd be nice to have it all covered, be like a white castle over it. <laughs> the dome's kind of framed by these, uh, these trees right here. Uh, it's just it's beautiful out here today. Brandon Howard spent Monday morning making sure people could get in and out of the Capitol safely. He said the storm caught him a little off guard. It's unpredictable, very unpredictable. So it'll be 80 degrees one day and three foot of snow the next. But he says he doesn't mind doing a little work in the snow. And as for tending to this photogenic spot so many people love, it's, I'd say it's an honor working out here, but okay, it is. <laughs> in Frankfurt, police say no one was hurt in any of those accidents. In Frankfurt, Sean Moody, WKYT. Probably the toughest thing about being a one-man band is constantly having to worry about covering the story that you're at, shooting enough video to make sure that you have enough for your package, finding the people that you need to talk to to get the information, um, trying to find the people that you need to talk to to get interviews, and doing this all at the same time. I think what the challenge is Doing everything, getting it done, and getting it done well sometimes uh, can be the, the biggest challenge. 
um, especially there are times where you come up on, on some kind of breaking news scene uh, and there's just a lot to do with that uh, all at once. You need to, um, trying to get video of the scene, um, what's going on, um, also trying to uh, get information, whether it's from police, fire department, um, eyewitnesses nearby. When you've got a reporter and a photographer pair, usually the, the photographer's got his eye out or her eye out looking for the best shots, the best video. They're going to be moving around trying to get the best video they can possibly get while the reporter will be going around talking with witnesses, talking with officials, getting a sense of what happened and lining people up to talk with once the photographer's ready to do interviews. As a one-man band, I have to be doing all those things simultaneously or prioritize them. Try and figure out which task is the most important at that particular moment in time. Do that one and then get to the next one as soon as I can. Um, there's no way to spread the work around. There's a lot of planning goes into um, to working alone out in the field uh, because you don't have another person. You can't divide and conquer, so to speak. Imagine starting a new job. It all seemed all right at first. And waiting on that first paycheck and that paycheck bounces. And then that second paycheck never arrives. Well, that's what Chris Damro says happened to him. I mean, I ended up losing my apartment because you know, I needed the job, needed the money, and you know, didn't get paid. Damro was a cook at Dairy Cheer before it abruptly closed before Christmas three years ago. We showed up one day and was like, hey, the doors are locked, you know, but everybody's gone. Then the next thing I know, they're saying that Lou just took off with all the money. Lou Compton was found in Michigan earlier this month. Anderson County deputies were able to find her by using social media. She was in the courtroom for the first time today, charged with 14 counts of unlawful taking. Compton's bond was raised from $5,000 to $9,000 to cover the money she's accused of owing her employees. Anything pertaining to electric, I fixed it. Employees weren't the only ones that say they weren't paid. James Phillips says he's owed $7,000. He plans to take civil action to get his money. Everybody's story is different, and when you get a chance to tell um, someone's story, give uh, a voice to someone who might otherwise not have one, uh, is one of the more rewarding aspects, I think, um, of this job. This home isn't hard to spot. That's because of the lights. Lots of them. Come inside, and you're walking in a winter wonderland in memory of a young girl who lost her life to cancer. But her legacy still lasts today. And what Jillian taught me was to have joy in the moment no matter what's going on in your life. And while I watched this little girl battle um, an important part of her life, she had joy right until the end. <laughs> That's why they deck these halls. The Burweilers say this is all about more than just all these lights and decorations. They say it's about bringing joy and putting smiles on people's faces. That we all see, um, I'm going to try not to get emotional, but the pain in the world. And there is so much joy, and there's so many people doing so many great things. And I think that there is no greater joy than giving to somebody else and blessing somebody else. And when people come through our house, they feel that, they sense that. Look under the tree, and Santa Claus has already come to town. These are the toys they're collecting for UK Children's Hospital. These children are stronger and braver than we'll ever have to be. And so people tell us all the time, oh, this is such hard work. I tell everybody it's a lot of work, but it's not hard work. With every light, every display, <laughs> and every smile, doing what they can to spread joy to the world. In Lexington, Garrett Weimer, WKYT. I think you get something out of every story. I think there's something that sticks with you with every story that you do. Is the evolution of technology. I went from carrying a 30 pound camera and about a 25 pound record deck. Both of these things had to have batteries. I had a belt that went around my. Or a, battery belt just to run the lights. It's like a Batman belt that operated the top light that goes on the camera. Now we've got about a, about a six or eight pound camera. So the technology's come a long way. It's good for us old timers who, are, who, who uh, 
maybe uh, you know need a little break from from their backs and things like that. But uh, people's stories are interesting and they need to be told. You're capturing someone in their most intimate moment. How similar we all are, really. I don't care if you're from Lexington or from Pikeville or a uh, little hollering Corbin. I mean, I've met nice people everywhere I've gone. There's a great responsibility for some of us that we look at it as if they're opening up their doors to us and they're letting us in. And they're usually telling us stuff that they've really not spoken to a whole lot of people about or something they feel extremely passionate about. So as a result of that, we have a responsibility to, to tell their story. You, you never know what that person is thinking or going through and during most of the time it's their worst time in their life. But it opens your eyes a little bit. With news you see so many different situations, so many different kinds of people that I think it makes you yourself a more rounded person. If I can understand or try to understand how they feel, then I can hopefully put that through a camera so the viewer can understand. I think you get something out of every story. I think there's something that sticks with you with every story that you do. If we don't understand how others feel, then how are we ever going to try to move forward or, 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 or make something better or change something? You know, we choose to stay behind the camera because that's where we feel we can make the greatest impact. When you're watching a story, you're seeing it through our eyes. You don't hear our voices, you don't see our faces. And when the silver, you probably won't even remember our names. But we're okay with that, because we love what we do. We're photographers. We are the people behind the lens.